Now, besides Joaquin Phoenix's epic performance in Joker, if there is one more thing that's undeniable is the cinematography behind Joker. How epic would it be to sit down with Lawrence Scher, the cinematographer of Joker, and really pick his brains and figure out what went into creating that masterpiece? Let's do that. What's going on guys, this is Kazi. Welcome to another epic episode in this series where we interview industry titans. This time it's going to be Lawrence Scher. Now I call it interview, but it's more of a conversation. You guys are picking up like what we are putting down in this series. So this is gonna be no different. It's going to be loaded with information that you can use as a filmmaker and apply it into your craft. And guys, Lawrence Scher is just such a genuine soul. He is so authentic and he has a way about explaining things where when we watch Joker, we think it's the best looking movie out there. But he takes it and breaks it down as if you can just go out there and do it yourself. So that's a true gift. And the knowledge that he's going to be dropping here is going to be invaluable. So grab a notepad. And for those that want to level up their color grading game, check out the link in the description. One hour long free training where I will show you how to get the perfect skin tones out of your Sony S-Log 8-bit footage how to get the clean white look, it's the go-to commercial look, how to get the creamy film look, how to fix the dreaded gamma shift, and much, much more. Link is in the description. And guys, if you're enjoying the content, smash that like button, subscribe to my channel for more awesomeness. Make sure you're following me on Instagram. I'm dropping value bombs there every single day. Let's roll the intro. Hey, I'm uh been having a fucking nightmare <laughs> with Spectrum for the last. Can we just like take five minutes and talk about Spectrum and the fucking mafia that is the internet in this country? I'm gonna sit down. Let's Hold talk on. Talk about it. First of hey, all, <laughs> first of all, I uh, I made the grand mistake of trying Frontier once, and then had a four hour breakup call with them, in which. Uh, I've been there. I'll never do that again. And now for the last 72 hours, I can't even get on the internet in my own uh, home. I'm not joking. I'm stuck in one area code. It's like 92618. This is how I search for a home. Like I'm stuck in that area code because that's where you get fiber and the speeds that I just sent you. It's like, it's vital. I'm, I'm a colorist. I'm sending 40 gig, 80 gig files back and forth. I need something that gives me that juice. I've never thought that I would move to get better internet, but now I'm convinced I know why people do that. So we're gonna I'm be coming soon. over. I saw you sent me a speed test of your internet. I'm coming over. I'm gonna do work. I'm just gonna treat, treat your house like a, a fucking internet uh, cafe. I'll bring the coffee. It's happening. I'm, I'm putting a 77 inch here today and I'm gonna be watching Joker in a couple of days. So if you're coming over, let's do this. I tell you, I've never been so jealous of a speed test in my life. I literally had to, it was like a double take. <laughs> it's like a nearly gig each way i'm like at a half a megabyte upload and uh god knows what i am download no it's it like, changes everything like i mean i'm uploading 40 gig files in like seven minutes six minutes you know so it's I, like stop stop it's just, it's just, <laughs> all right all right let's change the i mean listen just because i literally was typing with spectrum as as i'm like logging on to to internet to you know instagram You're right I, I'm like still riled up. It's going to take me a minute to calm down. So, but let's get off of it because otherwise I'll bitch about it for all day. No, no, we're going to do it right after this. So I just want to jump into, let's start with a quick sort of like the origin story, you know, who are you? Yeah. How did you start? Like more than who are you? Everybody knows who you are, but like how, how to end up here? Like, how did I end up as a cinematographer? How did yeah. I end up sort of like... I mean, I feel yeah. like even before, like, you know, I mean, I never wanted to be a colorist because I didn't know anything about That's color right. grading. The only thing that I knew was if you want to do something in films, you want to be a director. And then when I yeah. started going to school, I learned, no, that's not what I want to do. I want to be a cinematographer. I want to be an editor. So I want to hear your story. I never even, by the way, I'm jealous of your color correction on yourself. It just could be your own skin tone. I'm in, in incredibly magenta and red, two things I don't like. Uh, <laughs> That's just the I need, Can you help? Can you just help me for this uh, interview? Uh, all right, we'll work on it. Yeah. Uh, that's just the Russian Jew in me. Uh, the, 
and and people think I'm Irish, which I should I should fess up to being that, but I'm not. Uh, anyway, I never even thought about doing film until very late, very late in the game. I mean, I think, of course, I enjoyed movies and I watched them as entertainment and were influenced by them and, and thought they were wonderful. I was I really came at it. My dad was a doctor and you know retired doctor now. And doctors love hobbies, generally speaking. Right. And so his hobby was photography, but nature photography. So we always had cameras around the house. And so I always witnessed his passion for photography. And I think that influenced me subconsciously because he gave me a camera. I took a trip with my high school. It was kind of cool. It was a great public high school in Teaneck, New Jersey. Really diverse, amazing place to grow up. Uh, love it there. And uh, we, for some reason, went to like France on a French like field trip, basically, on my French class. Uh, and Jesus. it was wonderful. And he gave me his old Nikon F, which was like a 1968 body, like a, you know, and a 50 mil lens. And, and I went with it to Europe and took pictures and had such a great time. And when I came back, I remember seeing his reaction to the pictures and being like, well, these are really pretty good, which, of course, when you're young and it's right. your parents, you, you, you get such, such uh, you know, a, right. like a sense of, 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 you know, appreciation from feeling that from my dad, who I knew had a passion for photography. And then I kind of put that in a box and went back to sports and, and, and all the rest of this stuff, trying not to do my schoolwork and fuck off as much as I could. Yeah, exactly. And then when I went to college and I was like, I went to Wesleyan University, which is a, has a great film program, but I was actually an economics major. But I took a, like a survey class, just a regular survey class called the language of film. And it was a great class if you didn't want to, if you just wanted to fuck around in college, yeah. because all you did was watch movies. But what was awesome about it was it turned me on to the art and the craftsmanship of making a movie. And I started seeing it as a, a, as a collection of like pieces. And from that point forward, I got really into it. And then I started taking a couple film classes that they let me into not being a major and, uh, and then it was like off to the races. All I wanted to do was learn about film. I literally, I did graduate, but I barely graduated. Meaning the best, the worst part is as somebody who obviously is like expected to go to college and do all those things. Right. I was probably going to be a doctor, but I sort of fell off of that. My twin brother is a doctor. My older brother works in finance, like all respectable jobs. Right. Maybe not the finance thing, but anyway, but the... But I was an economics major, and I literally walked graduation with Martin Scorsese there, who was getting an honorary degree. What? And had an empty diploma. An empty <laughs> diploma. It was just a piece of paper with nothing in it. What? Because I had to go back in the fall and take one more economics test. No. Because you had to have a B minus average in your major. And I had a fucking C plus because of this one. Because I basically stopped studying economics and only did... <laughs> right my film stuff because i was like forget this this is exactly right. what i'm gonna do for my life like who needs economics wow so i was like a tragic summer of caddying at this golf course near my house and just not even studying but just waiting to go to the fall and the minute i graduated and i got that 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 test result and i knew i had a diploma i literally got in my car the next day and drove across to los angeles and started yes. trying to hustle to get yes. a job as a camera assistant and then sort of just keep keep hustling to try to shoot whatever I could shoot. Wow. So, I mean, cinematography was one of the things that jumped out to you? like or Yeah, that... because, because of my interest in photography, right? It was like right. a couple friends of mine who were film majors. And when I got into it in college, they were like, hey, you want to help with, with our, our like th senior thesis films? And so two different friends, one was named Scott Wiper, another guy was Jordan. I got fucking planes because I'm not even at home because of Spectrum, mothers. <laughs> Hold on. We're going to let this plane pass. It's great. It's a helicopter. Adding, it's a helicopter. Adding to the ambiance. Ugh, sucks. All right. Anyway, uh, Jordan Lipsansky, uh, both are in L.A., you know, um, and uh, they asked me to help with their senior films. And, and so that was like my first thing I ever shot were these two short films. And uh, one, I... I had they back then you had these like spectrum Luna Pro light meters and they had okay. these yeah. these 
things called a high slide. So if you were shooting outside, they literally measured foot candles, like, a, you know, almost like a decibel meter. And, and I didn't know anything. And so you had to have a high slide in, which would like basically, you know, correspond to like daylight when you had full sun. When you went inside, you took the high slide out. Well, I shot like an entire day of his, maybe two days, because you wouldn't even do the film until you were finished, all with the high slide in inside. So everything was two stops underexposed. Never make that mistake twice. Man, yeah. Live and learn. Yeah. So, yeah, live and learn. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then just, yeah, moved out to LA and started working as a camera assistant in mostly commercials and music videos for a couple of years, as many years as it took for me to just keep trying to fire away at shooting stuff. So, you know, do you have, because you, you seem pretty savvy with, with tech and even like, you know, your, Cre creating something like shot deck and everything just gives me a reason to think that you know you're not afraid of it so do you have like a this is my go-to camera package like that's what i want to use on a job do you have anything specific yeah or is it i mean I, I was i'm not very tech savvy and and if you ask my wife i can't even get photoshop I, I literally was trying to do this thing yesterday on photoshop and i was a disaster i don't follow instructions or read instruction manuals very well so i have to do everything visually and by doing it which also just is is difficult um and and so i'm not that tech savvy so the long it's like i'm not a lensy guy i'm not like one of those guys I, it actually intimidates me how many lens options there are in this world exactly. uh, that for me i was like a pan i was like a panavision primo guy forever very simple it was like Great probably choice. shot 20 movies on just primos and primo zooms i never even sort of went out into the world and sort of discovered other lenses because i was really a, just a panavision person for a long time the Alexa came out, and that was really the first time I, I went in. I shot the, the Genesis a little bit when they when the strike happened and everything was shooting. I shot a pilot or two on that. Uh, but otherwise, stayed away from digital until the Alexa, which I found to be pretty amazing. And then with the Alexa, stayed with Panavision, and it wasn't until recently with the Aries 65 that I sort of went away from Panavision and then had to sort of like find a little bit more about some of the lenses that were out there. But I'm wildly intimidated by lenses. Sometimes I use Shot Deck to look for movies and go, oh, wait, all right, this movie was shot on the, the Sumalex. Let me look at the Sumalex. Because if I had to that sort of start from zero and look right. at every manufacturer, it stresses me out just now, thinking about it. You're, you're going to have to turn into one of those guys that have all these lenses and they're doing testing and pixel peeping and figure it out. So you're doing it the smart way. That's awesome. Um, so much of like, I mean, we're going to jump around. There's so many questions. But, you know, the, the look DNA in Joker, I mean, I know like colorist has, you know, a lot to do with it too, but, you know, the, the blooming effect you get on the highlights and that kind of thing. And to my limited knowledge, like I saw that you used some sort of vintage glass on that, uh, whether it was in a, you know, new lens, but in a housing, like a vintage housing or whatever it was like, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Like how that can shape like you look at war dogs and then like how sharp and crisp that is compared to like, you look at something like Joker and has that, you know, we're back in the day, but then we know that it's new, you know? Yeah. I mean, the look, the Joker lens sort of, a lot of times it's a little bit reverse engineered too. Right. So we were going to shoot film until the 11th hour on Joker, right? It was going to be 35. We were testing, we were doing everything towards film and we only introduced the possibility of digital probably in the last week or two before we started shooting, you know, maybe three weeks out, we started talking about it, but like we made the decision really close to shooting. Once we sort of said, okay, because I was a big fan of the area 65 from I'd done Godzilla on it with anamorphic C and E series lenses. So, but you're not quite using the full sensor. You're sort of chopping the center because it's a four, three within that two to one sensor. Right. So you've right. got this, 2.1 to 1 sensor, or 2.2, I guess the full sensor is maybe. I should probably know these things. See, I told you I wasn't savvy. No, but it's in that range, right? Like the full, because it's basically like three Alexa sensors sort of meshed together to make that like really large format sensor. So the 4.3 obviously works within the center of it. Uh, we knew we were going to shoot 1.85. So the main thing is once we went digital and once we went large format, then you're sort of backing into options that will get coverage. 
So you're not like working in the whole palette of lenses. And because we weren't going to split the show, some stuff is like, I split the show with Panavision on Godzilla. We had anamorphic lenses from Panavision. We had the Aria Lexus rented from Aria Rentals. And they split the shop. The truth is, you know, it was like a $50 million movie and every dollar counted. And it was hard to split the job. Like I would have probably considered Primo 70s on the Aries 65. But I knew that we were probably not going to split the job. Right. So now it's like, okay, in the airy world of PL mount lenses, what would do coverage and what would have some speed, right? Because right. I knew if we were going to shoot digital, let's exploit as much as possible the fact that these digital cameras, you can go 1600, you know, ASA and, and, and really get a little bit more, um, you know, of the low light sensitivity right. stuff. So I knew about the, the DNAs, and I knew that some DNAs were quite fantastic, like the 80 is a great lens, and it's fast, and it's fairly close focus. But some of their other lenses weren't close focus enough to me. So I then reached out to Airy Rentals um, and said to them, okay, let's do this. We know I want these lenses to feel vintage like they would have been shot in the 70s and 80s because I wanted that sense right. of ver- verisimilitude so that it didn't look like a 70s movie, but you felt like it could have been made in the 70s. It wasn't like copying 70s, because the truth is, if you really compare it to 70s movies, it, it, it shares some of the d- DNA, right. but not really all of it. it less so than people think. Well, that's the first thing that jumped out to me when I watched it. Like, I was just so blown away. And I got home and I picked up my phone and I looked up Jill and I just voice messaged her and just told her all these things. I'm like, something is happening here that... I know that, it, you know, because it's so different than Justice League or any of those movies where they are very 2020, 2019. Right. They're like, boom, like this is the new Zack Snyder stylized look, which is amazing. But this had this thing that it had that it, it plays around with it. But then it has something that just makes you feel like you're in that time frame, that time period. And it was very different. So that's why I wanted to ask, like, how much of it is like, you know, these choices like whether it's lenses and obviously so much is like costume design set design those things too and then color um but it's just really interesting to know that um i want to talk about do you have like is it is it important to you to use a show lot are you using it on pretty much most of your movies or are you what's the process truth be told ever since i started shooting digital i never even really got that into lots Right. My feeling was I was so used to the sort of um, pipeline path of film. And, and I was always like one of those people who was like, if we're going to shoot digital, please don't tell me all the things it can't do. Once it's able to do anything, right. then I'll start shooting digital. Right. And so Love it. it's like I remember testing Ari Raw when it first came out for the dictator. And I and 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 we were shooting Alexa. That was like one of my first Alexa movies with like Ari Raw. I had done one sequence of of hangover two on the alexa and then hangover three we did like the vegas stuff at night and about maybe 20 or 30 percent on the alexa but but hangover two right after that was the dictator so that was like my first alexa movie and i tested like out in the desert like all the things they said this is where digital struggles so that was always the issue but the LUT thing was always very weird to me and i was never one of those people who even understood the LUTs. Or was like, oh, I'm going to have all these LUTs for the right. show. And I have this amazing DIT that I've worked with a bunch named Nick Kay, who did The Dictator and sort of figured out the pipeline of how we were going to do Airy Raw before anyone really even knew how to do a pipeline at all for it. That's- I remember, just as a side note, so we ended up transcoding and making our own LTOs for for a Dictator because there was no real sense. And the the idea at that point was like, you could have these codecs. This is very techy, so forgive all the people that aren't that. But Get so you're shooting. You're, you're like it's a, it's a line item that never existed before then, right? So we've been shooting S by S on 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 uh, digital, right? Which is very manageable. Small files, blah blah mm-hmm. blah. Everyone knows that. Shit, there's S by S material in Hangover too. You know, it's like it ended up on big screens. You know, for right. a while. But the Airy Raw is like now this massive amount of data. Nobody knew how long this would take. And Nick was like, basically had to sort of pave the way, pave a way of like a new pipeline to figure out how to manage all this data. And I remember at the time, Deluxe was like, okay, well, you'll get back these Codex cards 
that you can reuse and put in there 72 hours later or something. Well, then you start to like deal with like, well, how much, how many codex cards do we need to like manage a movie in which like Sasha's running, you know, hours of footage a day. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars and nobody was accounting for that, even on an $80 million movie. Right. So it blew everyone's mind. Nobody. So Nick was like, well, we can basically scrape the cards, back them up in three, three redundancies, including LTOs. And then we'll reuse the cards on the same day. Okay, that's fine. You would never do that necessarily. But Nick was like, let's do this because it's the only way we can afford to do this. So what's the worst thing you can imagine could happen is you erase a card before you've downloaded it. Day one of the dictator. Day one of the dictator. We did it. Now, the amazing part is we recovered that data. Never happened again. It's like you want to make your, you want to make a mistake for everything that could happen in a movie, right. you just don't want it to kill your career, right? Because every right. time you make a mistake, it becomes something that you'll never do again, right? right. Like double exposing a mag when right. you're loading, like flashing, all the things that you like, you know, are the worst case scenario. You actually do want to make those mistakes when you do stuff. The high slide thing, right? Yeah, so exactly. it's like, but you just don't want it to to like you know send you packing hopefully you know right. it has to happen those things has to happen so then they don't happen again like if that's people, exactly right right because otherwise you actually don't even know that's a possibility of happening exactly. right you know right. it's like it, it, and it's like i can think through literally every single mistake or every single problem i've ever had on a movie and point to what potentially that was right like exactly some weird flashing on a 35 millimeter mag and you're like why is that happening oh because old magazines sometimes would have a little bit of gap from usage in the back so you would tape over the back of the mag well you wouldn't do that unless you had that happen and you would get back some weird fogging that you couldn't put your finger on like so those kind of mistakes but the short of it is so and with jill and jill bringing it into to her you know into the uh the di suite we tested that thing But the LUT thing I never truly really used in the way that most people use them Mm -hmm. until Joker. And it was only because of Joker, because because we were going to shoot film. And I went to Jill immediately and I said, okay, here's the thing that we need to do. You know me, I don't use LUTs. So I'm not going to like create a bunch of LUTs. I I just like to just shoot the film and then, and then, you know, basically capture it, put some sort of grade on it. Sometimes literally I probably worked five, six movies with just a, rec 709 plain jane thing right and then would sit there with nick and go all right my standard ops thing like i'll take the blacks down a little i'll clean up the whites like literally like four tweaks was my thing on every single shot right right and jill knows this because it's like cleaner whites yeah yeah, the blacks and then we'll put a little cyan in the highlights and a little bit of like yellow in the in the low low end and then and then and then clean up the mids right like that was like my go-to thing right Love like <laughs> like three dimensional color rounded shape right. not you know but with like uh you know decent color saturation and like a breadth of color but but with uh joker i was like we have to make a lot that i can use for the whole movie and treat it like i'm shooting film so let's do whatever you can like let's reverse engineer a, a stock like 5293 which i think actually came out in 86 but like was of the like it was the best stock ever made, frankly. And I think most cinematographers wow. would say it was like the favorite stock forever. It was just gorgeous. It was the first thing I ever shot, first feature I ever shot was on fifty two ninety three. Um, and so it was like the greatest stock. And I said, let's just try to look at all the stuff we've tested on film, which was the stairs. We went down to Chinatown. A lot of locations in Joker, we actually took a film camera and an area alexa and like tested side by each oh, wow. okay. and had actual data so we had the the you know the street lights that were there and right. we had like that low angle shot of him walking up those stairs right i shot probably six times in prep with different cameras right so by the time we shot it for real with joaquin it was like we had done this a thousand times right. him coming up the stairs on the long lens same exact thing that's how we discovered those two shots was wow. like during prep and then I said to Jill, let's take all that data we have, like all the sort of like uh, like film stuff that we've already ingested, and now let's take the Alexa and like make them match in all the ways and then reverse engineer out a LUT that you can deliver to me, and that's the only LUT I'll use on the movie. Love it. And we had one little tweak that we did. We had like 
the hardest thing, like anything with digital, right, is that full breadth of color, right? right. Like film still beats the shit out of every elect every digital camera on full color depth, right? Like uh, an old sodium vapor never quite rendered mm-hmm. itself there. Right, 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 right. Little things like that. But then it was like, okay, Jill, can you reverse engineer and build the LUT that has as many of those qualities as possible so that when we just put the LUT on, that sodium vapor looks sodium vapor, right. That's that cool white fluorescent looks cool white. All those elements are there. And then the, she delivered me basically two LUTs. One had a little more color depth and a little more saturation. And one was like a little less. And for the first two or three days of, daily, of dailies, we went through with my dailies color, it's the company three. Um, we went through and, and, and basically uh, would play like right. two or three shots on both LUTs until we sort of narrowed in on the, on the LUT that, we, that was the rest wow. of the movie. And then that was it. The whole movie, I would just put the LUT on when we started the day, light to the LUT, light the scene, and that was it. Every scene, day, night, interior, exterior, all of that. How often are you switching? Are you messing around with like the white balance in camera? Or is it like, you know? A lot. A lot. I do that a lot, actually. I do. That's one of the sort of cool things I think about uh, the Alexa and, and other digital cameras that you can't do in film is like, absolutely. I'll, I'll literally on the set sometimes, even with Todd standing next to me, like the opening social worker scene or something, I'll set it up at 3200. And instead of like messing around with color, you know, on the resolve that right. Nick has in front of him, we'll like sometimes just go, let me see it at 3600 Kelvin. Yeah. Let me see it at 4500 Kelvin, yeah. you know, blah, 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 blah. And just play with that just to see if it gives a little bit of like an uncorrected daylight feel that we would do on film, right? Where yes. we just shoot without an 85, shoot with an 81 EF. But, but rarely, usually it's like, let's just shoot without an 85 and get a little more blue in all the daylight work. So similar kind of idea. Yeah, I love it. Um, so with the director, you're involved pretty early on, right? But with the colorist, like, I mean, is it something that, you know, for, for Joker, you did all this, but for, let's say, for something like War Dogs or, you know, something you've done in the past, like, are, are colors coming in pretty early on and you're connecting with them? Or is this sort of like, I'm going to do my thing and then when it gets into post and finishing, that's when we're going to sit down? And I, I think more and more colors have become a big part of prep for me. Because I'll just try to get some material shot somewhere through prep and toss it out to them. And so I say in the last four or five years, I try to bring them in as early as possible. That's you know, awesome. truly, truly like during prep. It used to be, of course, I remember back in the day, even before I met Jill, I was such a huge proponent for the DI. I had gone through like for all the people out there that are that are young enough to like not know what the old method was the old method was wonderful and i've seen results that you can it's just amazing right like uh you know and 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 you know uh you would basically have a hazeltine printing light timing system right which was basically three sets of lights zero to 50 red green blue right So it's just printer lights or whatever. Just printer lights. And you would literally shoot a film and put the printer lights at 32 red and 38 blue, you know, you know, green. And then, you know, and, and that combination of those three printer lights was every sort of color of the rainbow. Right. And it was an amazing skill to to be a Hazeltine timer. Right. And, and there are some amazing Hazeltine timers that are now colorists, but not as many, right? There are a lot of colorists that came up through the music video world back with the Bosch and all the early, you know, rank Cinetel and all those things like the early uh, uh, scanners and stuff like that, that would, that was like the beginning of the nineties and two thousands where, where we started really seeing colorists become such a big part of the equation. But when, when, when you start to now see real time color correction, all the things that, that telecine gave you right the idea was like whoa why is this not part of now the final product in the film right. world right and and i became crazy like crazy over like to the point that i want i was like fighting to shoot three perf because if you shot three perf you not only got 14 minutes of mag but you would shoot less film theoretically so maybe if we shot a million feet of film it meant that now we could only shoot 700,000 
and I could take the cost of 300,000 feet of film that you would save and apply it to this new thing called the digital intermediate. I love it. Yeah. And so I was like trying to negotiate with producers of how we could afford a DI. And then obviously, I, I remember like a thing was like I was negotiating like crazy on this movie called Dan in Real Life. So that's 15 years ago, 2005, right? It's, it's that long ago? That's insane. Well, I only know that because my son, I think, was like eight months old. And so everything is like based on the, the, yeah. the like when my children were born. Right. And, and I remember the whole pro- point going, can we do a DI? We shot 35, of course, and all that. Um, and they're like, no, no, we can't afford a DI. Blah, blah, blah. You know, back then, maybe it was $180,000, $200,000 to do a DI. Like, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. We can't afford it. And like, so, all right, fair enough, even though we shot three perf and all these things. And I said, and then by the time I remember we got to the DI, because of course we ended up by the time the movie was finished doing a DI. And, uh, and I remember talking to somebody at the studio and they're like, oh, no, no, no. First of all, a DI is not even part of the regular budget of the film. It's part of post-production. And it's actually something now universal or whatever we shot that movie. Right. We now require, and I thought, oh, great, that's the tipping point. Yeah. Now it was going to be like, if you didn't want to do a, do a DI like Nolan or something, you would have to fight for it. Now it became exactly. like a DI is now part of the, of the deliverables. And then I was like, great, because look at the amount of control. And that really changed film right. color. If you look at like the beginning of the DI to now, right. that's probably one of the most important technological changes in filmmaking. More so than digital, it's the DI and in the way that films look and, and, and show up on screen. No, totally. I feel like even just the birth of it, like 2000 to 2008 or something, you watch those movies and, you know, and that's not a hit to anyone that worked on it because we were developing a brand new system. But you look at those movies compared to even like the other day when we were talking about you watch Apocalypse Now, you watch Vertigo and you're like, man, like, they were doing this back in 70s or 80s like so why did we go back and now like we're on the other side i feel like the 2000 to 2008 ish was kind of like we're experimenting this is something brand new and you watch some of those movies and you're like ah, i liked it better when it was just shot on film but now like when i watch joker when i watch these new movies that really push color grading and you see it and you're like okay like even dr sleep you watch these movies and you're like okay i can tell that now that's a whole another level, you know? Yeah, and, and, and I actually have such great respect for how amazing, like you talk about Apocalypse Now or Vertigo or those kind of things. It's like how amazing both a Hazeltine timer is and how unbelievable just pure, raw yes. Hazeltine time movies can be. So it's more about like the frustrating thing about the Hazeltine timing was you would watch a print and you'd be like, oh, wait, 10, 10 points magenta and it was now already 10 seconds back and you, so you're like calling out changes as you watch it now in a way right it's also the bane of the of the yeah, existence yeah. of the di is now <laughs> your your palette is unlimited right right and jill knows this more than anyone it's like it's it can be and any director suffers from this right it can be like now oh jesus too many choices right like all of filmmaking is about limitations right and you need limitations, like the right. things that we didn't have at our disposal, the things we had to fight for, the things that we couldn't afford on Joker made Joker the movie that it is, right? Yes. It's like, yes. if it had unlimited percent. choices, unlimited budget, no, nothing in our way to stop us. It, it, those are the things that you want, right? Is Sometimes a DI can be a fucking mind. It, 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 and it's something Jill and I talk about all the time, right? It's like, because you can do anything, you right. can do everything, you, you, you can sometimes just get yourself completely turned around in there. And the yeah. beauty of like the old style was it was, it was like simple. And the, the one example I'll give about that is I remember back in the day we'd shoot film. I would run into the lab at five in the morning before call. And I would watch dailies come up from the day before because I was always anxious and nervous and I wanted to see the printer lights and I wanted to see it up on the big screen just to make sure there were no issues. And that was actually one of the most fun things. You'd be you, Mike Zachariah from Technicolor, it would just be the two of us in a, in a projection booth watching dailies come up. And it was Love magical, it. right? Yeah. And I remember I'd come in and invariably somebody would be screening their dailies before mine. And the two best dailies I've ever seen, bar none, I've ever seen in my life 
in the lab, dailies, not color corrected, you know, one light color correction, yeah. road to perdition, wow. well, you know, Conrad, Conrad Hall. Hall. Yeah. <clears throat> Those dailies, I sat there mesmerized like they were finals. But the best ever, and this guy, mad props to this guy. He should have kept shooting. No, he's a good director now. But Wally Pfister, and this wow. is like, if you talk to any DP, this is madness what this dude did, right? is he would shoot a whole, you talk about shooting a whole movie with one LUT. That's not meaning one exposure, right? He right. kind of did this crazy thing where he'd shoot his entire movies, one printer light. To, know, to people that don't understand that, it's like basically <laughs> saying, you put this light on and I'm going to expose everything perfectly so that if you watch it, it's going to look like the final, which means like not only is his exposure dead on, but all his lighting is like within a very small window so that that one printer light shows him everything. And I watched Inception dailies come up and there were like four or five scenes of dailies. And it was like the final, like final picture, print it, (laughs) put it in the theater. And I was like, this is one printer light. And to that, I, I always say Wally Pfister is like the greatest, He's the goat just for that one printer light thing, if, if that is in fact true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what the hell? Like, he's just not shooting anymore? Like, or is he No, he moved on to directing. No, no, and I think he shoots and directs commercials, and he's been directing TV and other yeah. things like that. No, he's, he's got a great life. I, I got no, no, nothing for that. But, but as a shooter, that yeah, was yeah, one yeah. of the craziest things I've ever, I've ever heard. And I witnessed it. I watched his dailies one day, wow. and I was, like, jealous beyond anything. <laughs> Let me ask you this. When you're on set, are you, do you love to cam up or do you have like, you know, go to cam ops and then you're kind of sitting in the back making sure everything is done right? Wait, do I, I, I literally, I'm sorry, Kaz, I got distracted. Sometimes I just look at these little comments and I'm like, maybe all I want to do is answer each of one of these things. I know, I, I, I'm like, I'm terrible at I'm it. I'm like, like, Chris Doyle, awesome, crazy yeah. dude. I met him at Camera Image, he's great. I'm just reading people's things. Somebody says Storaro. Storaro is, I love color, as people know, by watching my movies. He's the greatest. Conformist. Even that Wonder Wheel I just put up on Shot Deck. We just broke down Wonder Wheel, which is like a Woody Allen, Storaro recent movie. It's fucking amazing color. It's great. Uh, Somebody else, I don't know. I saw a bunch of these things. Sorry. Repeat your question, Kaz. I I, I, sorry. I got distracted by this this format. Do you do you love to be the camera operator on set, yes. or do you have like a cam op? Mostly? I do have camera operators that are amazing, and as they will know, I'm the worst person to camera operators because I constantly want to operate. Yeah. And on like and 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 some are are awesome with it, and they all have to sort of know that at some point I'm going to jump on the camera, maybe do a take, maybe do five takes. Sometimes it's just a way for me to connect closer right. to the lighting and all that. And it's, it's also the most fun part of the job. It's the, the part of the job that you're most sort of connected in the moment yes. to the scene and you're focused and you're, you're kind of maybe able to make small little changes. So like with both War Dogs and Joker, it was very similar. It was like Jeff knows, Jeff Haley, my A operator on War Dogs, and I mean on uh, both those movies, is the best in the business bar none. And no, no, no I mean, I've worked with amazing guys. Chris McGuire is amazing and, you know, all kinds of other people that are awesome. But right. Jeff is like, is, is my goat personally. And so he knows that I'm going to be on another camera. So like we make, we have a great now relationship where it's like, okay, I'll take B camera. And sometimes B camera could be like the A camera shot and A camera right. could be the B camera shot. It's like, we just work kind of around what's important in the moment. Um, so yeah, I love operating, but, but you know, so sometimes I'll do it at the DIT tent on a remote head, like a talent head, which I have right. so that I can watch both cameras at the same time and then I be annoying that. as shit. I'll have HMEs on. <laughs> and as you can tell from this interview, I talk a lot. So I'll sometimes be directing a, my dolly grip, talking to my assistant, while also maybe telling Jeff, like I'm coming in and watch me. I'm coming on your left. So watch my map box. Like, so there's like a lot of whispering yeah, me yeah, yeah. far away. So I get as far away as possible so I don't annoy the actors. Uh-huh. Um, there's a funny thing about that, which is everyone knows the Shane Hurlbit, can't, like, uh, yes. like uh, Christian, Christian Bale. Bale thing. Right, right. This is not long after that. I was doing that movie Due Date with Robert Downey Jr. And we were like 
we I, with Todd, it's always like whatever you start the day, you might end the day doing something totally different. Like, okay, we've got an hour. Let's go shoot something just that we right. just made up. Right. And and we got on a camera car real late in the day with like the idea of let's just go shoot a story that wasn't in the script. Zach Galifianakis and Robert Downey Jr. And we're cross shooting from the back seat, and we're like underneath, outside the windows. Uh, me and Tommy Lohman, who was the operator on that movie, and we're like cross shooting, and it starts fucking pouring. And so we're underneath thing, and like water is going down the back of your pants, and it's like it could not have been any more annoying. And literally, it's like whatever it was during the take, I start saying something, and I'm, I have headphones and all this, and it's probably pretty loud. And Robert Downey Jr. just goes, "Larry, I'm gonna." fucking christian bale you right now you don't shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. i was like all right all right gotcha gotcha because oh i'm like God. i'm going get that fucking tarp behind or whatever i'm yelling just because yeah, i'm like yeah, literally yeah, getting yeah. soaked and the camera's getting wet and it's like and and you know anyway so man you got so yeah. lucky you weren't on christian bale's set god <laughs> i totally get why it happened i think every camera wanna... knows i think that what happened was Shane and he's a great guy. I know him. He probably was something weird happening, and he probably peeked around the corner to see did I miss the light go off? Yeah. Did something move? It, it happens to every DP ever, and he probably just got in the eye line and shot him you know, fireworks. Came. I don't know. Yeah, John Connor just went rogue. It's a legendary <laughs> story. I want it's, it's such a legendary story. I wanna I wanna go through some of the frames. I try to keep these lives as like so it's podcastable if that's a word you know so i don't want to bring sure. in images or anything like that but i still have to because this is from war dogs and i want to uh, by the way you know i pulled all of these from shot deck so that's that this is amazing like i have a bunch of images but like i was just throwing them in there and then i just downloaded it and brought them yeah in so we can just look through them and talk about it a little bit but the thing that i love about you and i feel like more and more i learn about you i'm just like okay i I love this dude. Like it's it's just so amazing because you have to first of all you have to be sold to go this far. I mean that's far, right? I mean this is like <laughs> yeah. push like we were talking about traffic and we were talking about those movies like this is far. And first of all like you have to be sold on it that I want to go that far as a cinematographer a lot of the times people are just going to be like no, Kazi, can you go back? You pushed it too far, dude. Like, in reality, we were looking at these colors and that colors. Can you bring this back and that back? I'm like, come on, man. I'm trying to make, like, magic. Like, we're trying to create something here. So here, that's what's happening. And then even when you and I were talking earlier and you said with Todd uh, on Joker, you had to kind of sell him on that. Like, hey, keep pushing. Let's keep pushing it to get to that film look that we want. Like, where it's just unapologetic like those colors just pop and everything which in digital you know things kind of just live in the middle so when you're doing this like are you selling this that hey this is what it's going to look like are you playing a part in that is jill or whoever grading it just brings this to you and you just go okay i love it like print it like this is great let's move on with yeah this. it's interesting war dogs is a special a special um situation because so Back when Jill was at Technicolor, there was another guy who was critical to like my early days, Hangover, uh, Due Date, all of it, right? His name's Mark Sation, and he was the dailies color, colorist at Technicolor. And then he he went off and he, it was a lot of it was like, you know, there's so many conversations that I would have about workflow and pipeline and all these things. And I'm a big resolve guy, right? Love it. I don't know how to use it. And I, I should really just like take uh -oh. your masterclass. Yeah, but, like, do that and like, come over. But yeah, but the problem is, is like, so Resolve is not only like, so this goes back a little, right? To which is, so you would have aces and you'd have all these other things and people would say, okay, well, we're going to color dailies in basically RGB so it replicates film and it can be translated back to film and all these things. And that was like the way we colored during the early days of digital dailies and, and all these things. And, and I remember early on going, well, wait a second. Why are we, why do we, why are we basically taking all of this power that we're going to have in the DI, but limiting it on the daily side? And this was like a frustration of mine for probably six, seven years. And, and I remember thinking, well, why can't we color dailies and resolve 
and then track them all the way to the end. And truthfully, nobody had engineered that pipeline until like company three did it a little bit. And now other people are doing it, of course. But it was just a tricky thing of like old world and new world coalescing. And Mark Sation had a good idea, which we had sort of like talked about forever, which is like the resolve is something that's accessible now to all of us. Right. The technology of basically having a high powered ability to color dailies in your house finally became a reality, whereas it was like $250,000 minimum Forget about back it, in the right. day. So he basically, out of a Sprinter van, created a, a mobile daily station in which he could color. Yes. And he colored like uh, war dogs that way. So we brought him as like our dailies colorist, right? And even though we finished with Jill, he was like my first time where like Mark and I were like, okay, let's do this resolve thing. And he made me like download Resolve and I put it on my computer. Yeah. And then a lot of this early stuff with the color was like me and Mark, when, with me in Romania, which is where we started shooting. Yeah. And so this was like a shot in Romania that was like night for, it was like dusk for, for well, some of it, this might be more day, this shot, but like, right. but we were just, so that was a little bit of the, the problem of giving color over to a DP right. with that much control. Yeah, is, yeah. It's like me sitting in Romania in my hotel, taking dailies like and fishing them back and forth between me and Mark Sation <laughs> and just like going hardcore oh, and then showing it, so it to much. Todd and going hardcore and then pulling it back at the end with Jill and maybe not going so hardcore. But there's a lot of that movie that is a little bit like a little crazy in part because me and Mark were kind of like pushing each other. And Mark has like, a really uh, a good style himself. And, you know, once you, the problem is dailies become the movie, good or bad, right? And, and in the sense right. of like, you want to make sure, sorry, the planes are coming in again. Sorry. You want to make sure the dailies are good because the truth is I'm yet to meet, meet a director and maybe I'm sure there are some, but it's very rare that can throw everything out and start over in the DI. Right. It's like you live, with something for six months right it's the movie yeah. you know i and that goes back to like garden state i remember there's a shot in garden state you can find it probably you know this is not a plug for shot deck i'm saying you can find yeah, the yeah. shot on shot deck if i was on shot deck i'd show you the shot it's like they, they, they walk into before they go into this hallway to like watch this peep show inside like between the halls of a hotel right okay we shot that without an 85 filter because they were coming from the outdoors inside and I remember, I think I had a note to like color it back halfway yeah. in the in the timing. But the colors never saw the note. So it came back full blue, right? Yeah, right. It just never changed. And I remember when we went to finish the movie in Hazeltyn, I was like, well, Zach, man, that's supposed to be like yeah, yeah, corrected yeah. back. He's like, no, man, I love it. Because he had lived with it for six months, right? Oh, so I totally wow. get it. And so that's a perfect yes. example of what happens every movie. So if you don't right. get the dailies right, that is the movie. And so, and so like with Mark and I, we really pushed a lot of things and Mark, you know, did the dailies in this sprinter van for the whole movie. And so, and that was like a a new pipeline of like, because I wanted to start resolve and end in resolve. It's like, well, then we can just do it all ourselves, you know? And and that's the beauty of what you can do now with like the technology. Right. I mean, you're just having so much fun with it. You can see it like yeah, even yeah, here. Yeah. It's so much fun. And and the reason why I tell people, you know, use tools like Shot Deck or reference images. I'm really big on, you know, build your looks like recreations of your favorite movies like Vertigo. Like I will watch it for costume design. If I'm a director, I will start there and then I'll get into the color grading aspect of it to really dial that look. I'm such a huge fan of it, but I'm just saying like, I'm so big on look recreations because I feel like, you know, we're as creatives, we're always inspired. We're always like bringing in, like creating a jambalaya of like, I like this from Fincher and I like this from like Tarantino. And it's like, you know, then I create something of my own and it just, you know, this, like looking at stuff like this, one would never think to do something like that when you shoot something on S-Log 2, when it's so flat that when you just dial in the Rec 709 and everything, you're just like, oh man, I already pushed it too far. Like, I don't know what else to do. You get what I'm saying? So to have something like this gives you that permission to be like, oh, I loved it when I saw it in theater. 
and it looked amazing. And this is what it looked like? That there was that much green in the sky? Oh, okay, let's try it. And then you try it and you're like, this is amazing. Like now I'm actually creating a grade, a look, you know? And that's why I just, I have so much respect for you that I just see this kind of stuff. And I'm like, then we have the traditional teal and orange, which is so great. This is perfect. Then we got this, which I love even more. Like once again, you just go there and you just live there, you know? <laughs> well, I remember that day, right? Because that was just a cool location, right? It's in the valley yeah. and it's an old like uh, shooting range, you know? And uh, his mark is sitting literally just outside the walls to the left in his sprinter van. And he's just like, at lunch, we're showing it to Todd. And Todd's like, that's fucking crazy. It's too green. <laughs> Whatever it is. It's like, and then we pull it back a little. Then we do a normal one. And Todd's like, yo, that's too normal. So it's yeah, like, yeah. and then, and then I think this is why it's also annoying to Todd. Because he's like, I don't want to be thinking about all this color shit while we're making the movie. <laughs> and it's truthfully why he loves film. Because he's like, let me deal with that another time. Like, right yes. now, I got to concentrate on the scene. And I, I totally understand that big time. Um, but it's like, in truth, it's the reason why Shot to exists is I just, through my entire process of making movies, either I was thinking of something of another movie or, or some other reference. It was just having the ability to communicate through stills some idea, right? Whether you're like using it as a leaping off point and then diverging from it but you like one element of it. You're like trying to replicate that sky. You're trying to show a VFX artist like, oh, that's the kind of blue that we're going to create when it's like a complete CG shot. Or it's just like, yo, how green should we go here? Is it, is, are we looking for like traffic blue? Or right. are we looking for like, you know, that whole half of the hate you give blue? You know what I mean? Right, like, you right. know how that, that movie's blue and half that movie's orange? It's like exactly. that kind of stuff. It's like, let's just find a reference point so we can talk about it. Because if we go in with nothing, then the DI can be like the most like terrifying experience in a lot of ways. Because no, it's, it's just so easy, right? Because you look at like, if I just go, hey, give me the Terminator blue. Like then I just narrow it down to give me that blue, you know, that like primary like solid blue compared to like give me joker blue you know that's which right. would be something in this world you know that's like that's what's happening today but even if you watch the dark knight those blues are very close to the terminator blue you know they're kind of going with that so yeah. i feel like it makes the communication pipelines it's just so much easier than to just you know get the thoughts out and people need to understand that because I get so much heat about it. Sometimes that people are just like, Hey, what about creating original palettes? And I'm like, ultimately you will end up with an original palette, but you know, like you have to. A hundred percent. Well, that's the thing about like creating an original movie. Every single movie is in some way influenced by all the art that's come before it. Right? Like we are storytelling by its nature is a sort of a fluid, like, process that is constantly sort of drawing from its previous owners, right? I mean, uh, I'm a huge, huge Quentin Tarantino fan as a filmmaker. I think his movies, like, there's no movie that I felt as excited, like, when, the mo when I was watching it and when it was over, than Pulp Fiction. I remember, whatever, oh 1995 God. or whenever right. it was, watching that movie and feeling, like, exuberant over how yeah. original it was. But then you can see all the videos of like all of his references. Well, I didn't know those yes. references. So the movie is still hot, wildly original to me. And it 100%. is a wildly original because he's sort of using all of his influences that have come before him to create this new thing, right? That still makes it a, for a piece of original film. So, you know, I, I always feel like I don't, I, I can look at all the references that are in my decks, let's say, right. when I was prepping shot, you know, uh, Joker, right? On shot deck. And there's not one image that looks like Joker, but they right. all influence Joker. Collectively, yeah. Exactly. Right? And so that's a perfect example, perhaps. I think, I think well, let's just get into it because with somebody like yourself, I can have a conversation for 12 hours straight. We're going to get booted in seven minutes. I do want to jump into what? shot deck. Seven uh, minutes. It gives us like one hour. It sucks. I mean, I think we can go again, but I want you to now kind of just dive in and, and tell me why, like you already kind of gave us the why behind Shot Deck, but explain a little bit more. And I think the most, the, the craziest statement that you just made is that 
you use shot deck for Joker. So that in its own right tells you the, the, how legitimate this tool is and what it can do. Wait, hold, I'm going to spend one minute and then we're going to answer some of these questions. Because shot deck, I created it simply as a, as a place to find reference materials for research, right? So you're looking for something to like as a reference or a research thing for the project you're working on. For inspiration, sometimes I just go on to just get inspired for something I'm future working on uh, and also to study and learn from. But the main thing is it's a, it's a collaborative tool of, and a database of images that from which you can draw, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the things you need to like prepare for your next project, whether it be a pitch deck or whether it just be for your own personal prep of a movie, finding like inspiration for different scenes or locations that you have in the, in the project. Uh, but it's, it's, it's also fairly self-explanatory. There's a couple of videos and stuff. Kaz did a great video that you can watch. That's really good. But I want to, if we only have that much time, I want to answer some of these questions. And first of all, props to somebody. I was looking down and somebody said, yo, stop looking down, look up at him and listen. And you're right. So props to whoever wrote that. It was probably my wife. Just and if tell not, me who that is, that, that person is. is getting blocked. No, it was great. No, I'm <laughs> saying props. To, I want that, that person pointed it out. No, that's perfect. I'm, I'm giving props to them because they were right. Like I should be, but I, no. but I'm, I'm reading all these things peripherally, and I want to answer some of their questions. You go for it. Go for it. I, I have not. Get... By the way, I've not used Eternity. I'm just going to answer the couple questions because now I feel like we have limited time. Yeah. I've not used Eternity, but I want to, and I might on my next movie. Uh, that I, I, I've just seen it in displays and stuff at, uh, at like uh, camera image and obviously 1917. So I haven't used that. Somebody said, did I go to film school? No, I studied a couple film classes, but I was an economics major, liberal arts, undergraduate only. My film school was actually making a movie that I made with that friend, Scott Wiper, who uh, I went to film school. Who he went, he was studying film, but I went to school with and, and we made a movie together. All right. What other questions we got? I mean, I can read them now. I feel like I passed through a bunch of... I did not go to film school. How important is it? Well, oh, they're going by so fast. I feel really... This is like a time crunch. Hey, creative first or tech first? That's a great question. Creative first. You don't have to be that technical. I thought Lighthouse was amazing. Jaron is a really... He's a really... Uh, full frame... What's that? Or crop sensor? Well, that depends on what you're shooting. We cropped a sense. We cropped a sensor on joker because we shot 185 so we didn't use that full two two one two two to one image uh i'm just answering whatever is that would you recommend going to film school sure i also think if you can get out there in the field and just start working you'll learn a lot as well i think you can learn a lot my film school was like reading american cinematographer and going out with the camera and shooting stuff and like i think eventually you're gonna have to get out and learn on your own and shoot but i think film schools as proven by like maddie libatique and a bunch of other people they're a great opportunity to meet future filmmakers that you're going to work with forever. So, right. um, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's a very expensive club to make connections. Eureka moment from small to big movie. It's a series of Eureka moments. I mean, the biggest movie was like my, was Dukes of Hazard, which was like a $50 million studio movie. And it was just about managing a machine that's much bigger than let's say garden state or something like that. But at the end of the day, a hundred and eighty million dollar movie is exactly the same as a one million dollar movie. At the end of the day, you're just making one scene at a time. It's actually not intimidating when you think about it in those terms. Hmm. Learning from the internet or set experience. I think you can definitely learn a crap load from the internet, but you gotta go and do it. Because until you do it and the pressure's on and you have limited time, resources, you're not really going. It's like you could be the greatest colorist in the world at home. But yes. until you have somebody breathing over your back and going, change yes. this and change this and, and getting frustrated, like right. th- you're going to have to deal with like what happens when you're, when you're like, when, when the frustration level rises and like right. the, you're not delivering on something that they're looking for, that's going to be where you learn the most when you get paid and when you can get fired, you can't fire yourself at home. <laughs> exactly. So fear is a great motivator. Oh shit! So many questions. So little time. What do you think about printer lights? Okay, so you obviously love printer lights. Yeah, I still sometimes will. Like I had printer lights for Joker when we were going to shoot film, so I could figure out where I was at on certain things. Area or Panavision, both. Have you ever shot in Atlanta? Many, many times. Four or five years in a row. 
simple. To, oh shit! Advantage of area raw in Da Vinci. You know, I'm oh. gonna take it. I'm gonna take it up as a challenge, and I'm gonna do a tutorial where I grade only using printer lights. Oh, that's fun. I know. Th I know. Like at Deluxe, that uh, on some systems and stuff. I remember when I think I did the Big Ear or some other movie that I did. That it was like, well, let's just do it like printer lights. But honestly, I liked doing it like in a sort of raw, like uh, resolve, yeah. like let's just right. do it like as if Photoshop, right. I call it. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like let's just have all the tools, you know? Right. I mean, no, there are that's... tools, there are tools in Lightroom. There are tools in photos. There are tools on Instagram that I wish were like simple tools that you could do in resolve. You do have those tools now, but I yeah, remember yeah. back in the day, it would be like, right. why? I would always say to Jill, why don't we have a button that just makes it look like Super 8 in the Resolve? Because I got yes, it on my exactly. camera on an app right. that's pretty damn good. Or, or Resolve didn't even have temp and tint, you know? Right. Like, or like know. just controlling highlights, right? Like that's a yes. standard thing of like just grab the highlights and let's deaden them or something or just right. bring them into balance or, or same thing on the blacks or like, like some basic things that like you see commonplace across the internet on apps are like some of the greatest like tools that are that you know you know you think like, these are nothing and you can have all right wait all right, right we're about gonna, to get kicked off I realize it was just an hour yeah yeah they're gonna i i think they're gonna kick us out i think it's around one hour but i do want to take a moment to thank you so much you are like you got so much going on you took the time to be here it is amazing and um just like everything that we talked about, I feel like there's so many value bombs. This will go on my IGTV so people ah, can watch it. Yeah. But guys, go well, check out Larry's page. It's Lawrence Sure DP, one word, right? Your Instagram? Yes, it Lawrence Sure DP. That's my Instagram. But also, I thank you. I'm a fan. I remember watching just recently the, the Blade Runner look and I went, that's awesome. And I like what you did. And I reached out to you and I said, Hey man, what, can I do something? Cause you've been giving me props on, on stuff. And so I was like, let's do something. And you said, let's do this. And I, it's my first Instagram live. So you, this is you amazing. I'm, you I'm diverging me. I'm on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I wish much. I could, I wish I could go for another 20, 30 minutes just to answer all these questions. Cause uh, I know that's, that's I mean, really what I like to do. Well, maybe Let's we'll keep, keep doing going. it until until yes. they kick us off, until Zuckerberg yes. gets a hold of this shit, shuts us down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he'll shut us down if I start talking politics. That's, no, what, that's the surest way. <laughs> oh, yeah, people are doing that great. I want to know who told me not to look down because I really did mean props because thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> you just you learned so much today. Somebody asked that, uh, was Joker influenced a little bit by Taxi Driver? I mean, of course, it, it was influenced in so much as, as like, uh, it's a character study, deep dive into the psyche of a human being. And of course, I did like bring some pictures into my folders and look at them, but only in so much as I, from the first time I saw that movie, I appreciated that it was out in the streets and it had all that mixed color, right? So like you would yeah. have uncorrected fluorescence in the diner. And all those like great color mixes of the sodium vapors and and like the warm whites and the cool whites and all those things. So in that regard, it's influence. You know, it has some 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 play into what the Joker look is for sure. And of course, it's like for my money, top two, top three movies of Scorsese ever. And I rewatched it for the first time after I made Joker a year after I hadn't watched it during the making of Joker, and it was. Oh my God. If you haven't watched it again, watch it because it, it is, up. it's his masterpiece, man. Wow. It's his masterpiece. I, I I'm going to say it's his best movie ever made and just stand by it. It really wow. is. It is. It is. Cause it's tight. It's his, it's like, he's trying everything. Yeah. And the, the I'll say this about why I think it's the best is he did things in that movie that then became a Scorsese thing, right? Yes. Like yeah, weird, yeah. like, but when it, when he did it on that, it wasn't mean streets. Cause that didn't have it. Right. He was trying it on Taxi Driver, and then it became his thing. Yeah. That then, you know, as filmmakers, sometimes you have to like do the thing that the audience wants. It's like yes, exactly. It's, it's like playing the hits. Right, yeah, right, right. is when he made Taxi Driver, he hadn't discovered what those hits were, and and yeah. when he made that, it was like the rawest, most experimental version of himself. Yeah, I agree awesome. with you. I feel like I mean, my, one of my favorite movies from him is like The Departed, only because it can just be on for nine hours. 
in the background. And anytime I'm going to sit down, or I'm going to catch a scene. I'm going to end up watching the whole movie. It just, it, it's so tight and it's so long, but it just goes like, you just cannot stop. Everything is just, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, how he stacked it up. I just, yeah, personally love it. Yeah. That's amazing that he can still do it at such a high level. Yes. Not, not that he can, cause his brain's obviously all there, but like, just that you have the stamina and the energy yes. to go like movie a year for like 35, 40 years. You know what I mean? No, it's crazy. It's real. How did you get noticed as a DP in the industry? To some extent, it's like the work begets work. And so some of it is a little out of your control because it's going to be perhaps about a movie that gets seen. So I think Garden State helped do that for me. Kissing Jessica Stein maybe before that. But I think, unfortunately, you can do a lot of work, but it's like it's maybe one thing that just puts a little bit more of a spotlight on you to other people. And then it gives you other opportunities. So, so it's a hard thing because you don't have as much control over that. That's going to so, be like outside forces, but so just I mean, keep I'm, making good stuff. I'm thinking like after you got nominated for the Oscar uh, for Joker. Yeah. I mean, you still can't get fiber at your house. Like, I mean, what good is it? I know. I swear to God, man. Like, I think like, <laughs> As a bonus, like, you know, I didn't get any extra money. So as a bonus, they should just fiber my house now that AT&T and Warner Brothers are merged. Like, you, can you just run it right to my doorstep, please? Let me tell you this. If you do want to go that route, I did make a call and I asked at one place, like, where I didn't have fiber. They were like, we'll do it for you. It's going to be $2,500 a month with a three-year contract. Uh, if Warner's pays for it, I would love it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Okay, so one of the questions that we have here that I just read was, uh, do you, like, if there's one that you have to pick, I know it, it, it's kind of a difficult one to answer for a cinematographer, but lighting or composition? Like, or but for me, probably composition. But, but that's just because I don't consider lighting my forte. Um, there are so many one, other people that are better. This is one of better. the most beautiful composition ever. <laughs> this is so good. That was fun. That, that was just a, like a very skeleton crew. We went out there after, at the end of the day, after shooting, just with like eight people. and one, two sticks of Dolly track. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay, this is a specific shot. I yes, can that's have it. Jeff Haley. I can have this as my screensaver just until I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> until I'm dead. Like, that was this. a great scene. I mean, that was like, you know, we're running two cameras simultaneously. So Jeff is basically in his normal sort of cradled handheld position on that side of the of the um uh the hospital bed i'm on the left hand side so if you watch that scene everything that's shot sort of wide and to the left is b camera and jeff shooting simultaneously just off my right hand side of my camera frame so very perfect example of how we shoot two cameras not from the same position but we often cross cover them or shoot them so that we can use both as as like as opposed to like A and B cameras next to each other, one bigger, you know, one, one closer and one wider. We rarely ever do that. No, that's so it's always about that. like, what can we do with the B camera that is actually like another piece of coverage and not just some other size? So that's a great question. I had another question that somebody had asked in my story, which was how often is, you know, Lawrence changing his lighting setup for going from white to tight? So that kind of answered it, right? Like not that much, like you're kind of prepped for that. Yeah. Like basically I light the space so that we don't have to do a lot of lighting within the scene. So rarely do I bring any lights into the set. Try not to try to like light for a master, shoot the master. So like, obviously on a master, both Jeff and I, let's say on the Joker are going to stay wide enough to like not photograph each other. But hopefully, you know, two completely different sides of the space or at least, you know, 50, 60 degrees away from each other at the minimum. And then we just kind of march in and clean it up with a couple different lenses and positions based on what we see in the master. So while we're shooting the master, I'm watching and thinking, oh, this next angle would really cover this nicely. And it's already in good light. And Jeff could go here. So the minute the master is done, we swap lenses and just go, OK, let's go here and here and just keep shooting. So. The time between setups is really as, as long as it takes to change the lens yeah. um, and then just like motor through it. So we, you know, sometimes there's a lot of conversation and just like easing into the day. So it might take a couple hours to get the first shot. But right. once we start shooting, we go and we shoot very quickly. And even in this specific scene, I, I think I was watching your interview with Variety or some, somewhere where you talked about like this one's 
you know, lit with a similar intention where yes. you know, the ca camera op is there and, you know, you just move around freely. Like That's right. And it was really single camera except when I went into the bathroom stall, which if you haven't seen that Kevin James thing he does where he plays the sound man, I watch did. it because it's the funniest thing ever. It's and the B camera or the, the, the camera I was on, only the only other piece of coverage in that scene besides Jeff doing the sort of like full 360 following uh, him around, which is really what the scene is, is from the stall that Kevin James is in. Uh, that's the only other angle we did was like that open stall and shot there in a way that was also simultaneous so Jeff could keep shooting. But otherwise, it's really just a great example of Jeff and and Joaquin sort of dancing together. So yeah, that was really fun. That's unreal. I do want to talk about this because this is one of the cleanest, like white look that there is like, and, and I tried to replicate a little bit of it too, like this shot specifically, and I was having the hardest time. So how much of it is like the, the, the color temperature in camera to Jill coming in to your lighting setup, like what's happening? Not a lot, you know, it's like, this is a mirror mirror set, right? Like if you actually took like a bird's eye view of the stage, this is like mirrored. So if you go out the wall, the, the door that's behind Joaquin, right? If yeah. you went through that door, there's a hallway. If you went through that hallway five feet away, there's another door, that's the social worker scene. So those two things are like mirrors of each other in oh, the wow. sense of same size, that window's the same size. It's meant to replicate like the social worker, but in another world. Um, and really it's like we have a soft box above it that's like an open square in the ceiling of about 10, 12 feet. And we have a couple lights hitting the little me uh, yeah. metallic table. But really, it's those two fluorescents and then that little softbox along with two harder lights that are hitting the table. And that's all the lighting that's in the scene through all the coverage and everything. If, if you know, like that table's doing a lot. And, and this, B, this is B camera at the same time. And uh, that, that close-up, which is on the, oh, the 350, yeah, that, which is one of my favorite shots in the movie, that 350 at minimum focus at a T4 and two-thirds or so. Uh, oh. Yeah, and really, it's like basically white, except you can see the cyan, which to me is always an example of the difference between film and digital, right? It's like there isn't... Jill was always the person that would tell me this. Like, Jill, we would always talk about this from like going back to our first movies together. She's like, there's no clean white in film. And she's right. There's nothing as, there's no true clean white in film. You can create yes. a clean white in the DI, but film is inherently has some cyan in the highlights. And so yes. that was part of building the LUT was putting some of that cyan in the highlights. So there was never really like what would be called a totally clean white, you know? Like you can right. see just the white that's behind my shoulder, how blue right. and different it looks in, yes. re you know, when you relate, right? Yes, exactly. And even yeah. magenta, because there's so much green in that shot. But if we put something, you know, everything's relative to like what's in there, right? Yes. Right. No, absolutely. Mellowing right. man, you said, may I ask something? Sure, go for it, mellowing man. <laughs> I'm not supposed to look down, but I did. Go for it, mellowing man. Come on, dude. Now's your shot. I know. You got one shot. Somebody asked, like, what do you think of Deacons? <laughs> I mean, he's he is without question the best that ever was and ever is. He's so great, and and he's doing better work every year than he ever did. I mean, it's really amazing. I, I find, and I've met him. The process of the Oscars, the best thing about it was meeting some people I hadn't met before. So I'd That's never met amazing. Roger. I got a chance to to meet him. I got a chance to have dinner with him one night with him and his lovely wife, um, James have you gone on and. There? Be I've gone. gone I've listened. To, I've been listening to their podcast. No, I'm not on it, but I've been listening to it. It's great. But he's the best. I mean, if you look at, if you look at a, a site like Shot Deck again, not pitching it, and just like look at how many images are like the most clicked or like it's like his most movie, popular. Yeah, yeah. His yeah. images are just like amazing, amazing. It's like he never ceases to impress me. But what's him. really crazy is that like I always feel like just looking at his stuff is all those it gives you a feeling of like it's so effortless like that's always the word that comes to mind anytime i, I look at his work i'm like 1917 is so effortless like when people ask me to do that look i'm like but well, what is there to do 
because it's just so effortless. But then I know when I start creating it, I find out like, just like how, when I did Blade Runner, I'm like, holy, like, okay, there's all these things that build it, but it's the, the combination between Mitch Paulson and him. Like it just, Oh, I know. But his, he's the best person to look at, to recognize that simple is, is uh timeless, right? Like his photography style, his lighting style, is so consistently simple. And mind you, simple is always, is never simple, but right. whether it's like a book light, like the, yes. the bounce light that he does, the single source light that he does, it's timeless, right? It never looks out of style and it's, right. <coughs> it always looks great. And, and, and he's a great example of somebody who never overcooks it. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. And that's yeah. that thing you say is effortless. Somebody asked, <coughs> Uh, why should we keep film alive? Well, we should keep film alive because it still works magically well. Like, I mean, I just watched that show. Uh, I know this much is true. Uh, I'm a big fan of Succession, uh, Westworld. Like, a big influence on Joker was the movie, um, uh, uh, the, the Yorgos movie, the, the Killing Sacred Deer, Killing of a Sacred Deer. That was shot on film. There are so many times lately, not just movies that are obviously shot on film from 30 years ago, but recently when I see something that just engages my senses and it's something that's been shot on film. So keep it alive as just another palette and another thing that we can use to make movies. So we should definitely keep it alive. I was talking to Joe, like when I, we did a live, she was saying that it was up until you know, now that it, we're getting to a point where people are kind of, it's not dying down, but, you know, there's not so much of like, make it look like film, make it look like film. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, film, yeah, yeah. You know? And I think that is, that's huge. Like, I mean, that just speaks volume to like where we are today with, you know, DI and where we're headed. Well, like, think about her, right? Her doesn't look like any film. And I love her. You know, yeah. the Hoyt, Hoyt movie, that, like, the, the Spike Jones oh one. God. It's like, it's awesome, right? That doesn't look like film. It looks like its right. own thing and it's yeah. gorgeous. And in a large part, you see the commercial world as leading the charge of like, no, let's not make it look like film. And some of it was accidental, right? Like you think about one of the downsides of shooting digital is like, we lost a lot of the dailies colorists input into the movie, right? And so when right. you shot commercials, you had to go through dailies because that's how you, you got film into a digital format. Like it couldn't go raw to the to the editor. Well, now right. with like transcoding on set and even sometimes like you'll get stuff delivered that's like effectively log and the editor will just put a Rec 709 on it or whatever it is. And you realize, oh, that almost became the modern commercial look, which was right. like opened up blacks a little bit yeah. like like lower contrast. And it became so commonplace that now like you just see that as a look of, and I feel like her was to some extent because yes. Spike shoots so many commercials like yeah. a reflection of that new style. You it's know? like a fragrant spot, but like exactly like it. Yeah, movie. yeah, yeah. It's like just this Vogue look and like that's the film. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, exactly. No, I love that. I love that aspect of it. All right, if you're tired, just uh, we can call it. I'm Let's not tired. It. I'm like reading some of these things. If you're tired, you sound tired. Guys. <laughs> no way. <laughs> uh, Wait, hold on. My my all my projects don't start till August, so I got time. Okay, that's so why I'm just movies, I'm a hundred percent shot there. How many movies a year are you? Do you usually do? And are you? Do you oh, do commercials? One, if I do one movie a year, I'm happy. If I do, I do some commercials, not as much as I'd like. If uh, I'd like to do more, um, I rarely will do more than one movie in a year. Sometimes, but uh, if I do a movie. Uh, I try to just take some time off and do some of the other stuff I like to do. Yeah. Opin opinion on Lubeski. I mean, Tree of Life is as influential a movie. I thought the movie was mesmerizing. I mean, what? He's the only person ever to win three Oscars in a row. Jesus. That's what is not that about? The goat. I mean, you can make a strong argument. He's, he's, and, and he's, uh, I mean, his where his work has has influenced me. It's like again, it's like Deacons. It's a simple yes. thing, right? It's very simple. And by the way, he's also he's also changed in a way that I feel like is really amazing. Like you go back and look at Great Expectations, which was also Coron, and Did like you do the Children of Men, of course, yeah. But like you think about uh, 
the heavy backlighting and the sort of, yes. you know, go look at reality bites, right? Like Ben Stiller, I had the, the pleasure of working with Ben Stiller on some reshoots of Walter Mitty and he's a great filmmaker. Ben Stiller picked Emmanuel Lubezki to shoot reality bites long before Emmanuel Lubezki was like common, common name in the, in the business. <sighs> he knew from the get that that dude was amazingly talented and Reality Bites is a cool looking movie when you go back and watch. It. I'm going to put it on Shot Deck. I bought the Blu ray. I'm going to get it up there soon. But, oh, yeah. but because I wanted to say, like, well, look at Lubeski's arc. But you look at, you know, Great Expectations and um, The Little uh, Princess, right? Was that, no, what was it called? It was like, uh, is it The Little Princess? And it was like early studio stuff that he did, right? And then you yeah. look at his transition from Itu Mama Tambien, yeah, and then into obviously like the the more modern stuff like Revenant and Birdman and all that. I mean, you know, think about it. if you're shooting now on a wide lens in that sort of long take stylistic thing. That's a that's in large part because Lubeski led the charge yes. to get there. So he's he's had wild influence on on all of filmmaking. I had to make a list. The Academy's like, oh, we're going to do this list of movies that are influential. And just start screening them. And they said, you could make a list of three to three to five movies. And I just quickly filled it out. And the three movies I put in there was The Conformist, Storaro, amazing. Um, uh, Children of Men, right? Which is Lubeski. Yes. And it was like so influential. And then, wait, what was the third one? I'm forgetting now, which what I put third. I don't know. I mean, it could, it could have been... Joker. No, it could have been, it could have been, uh, Road to Perdition, maybe. Because I think, like, every single frame of that movie is just unbelievable. Yeah. Apocalypse Now could have been in there. Apocalypse Now could have been in there, whoever wrote that, Mellowing Man. Wait, Mellowing Man's back. Did he ever ask his question? He just never asked his questions. I think he just ends his statement with a question at the end. Maybe his question is, is is Apocalypse Now? uh, Yeah, exactly. I'm just reading it. All right. Oh, Indian movies. I'm trying to get more on Shot Deck. I haven't seen enough. My wife is a Patel, so I'm trying to like oh, come on, immerse you're myself in more market. Indian. market. Tell me is about huge. it. I'm not. I know I'm missing it. It's just like, like there's only so many time, hours in the day, but I'm trying. I'm working on it. Oh no! Anytime I go home to see my family, my parents, and they have like you know Indian movies playing in the background, like I'm always rolling my eyes. I'm like. Oh, man, this stuff is so cheesy. Next thing you know, three hours go by, and I watch the whole thing. It's just so no, and and, and and I've had two people on Instagram. One guy is helping to put a movie or two on Shot Deck from India, and they've sent me lists of Indian films and filmmakers, and I'm like, I love it. And I'm putting it – I have, like, a master list of all the movies that I want to get up on Shot Deck next, and it's like 1,500, 2,000 movies and growing. I've even got my 14-year-old son working on compiling this list. Yes. And, How much and, is he getting paid? I, he's, I minimum wage, but still, it's not bad. <laughs> no. But but in my, in my house, minimum wage is $15 an hour because oh, I'm a liberal. God. I'm a liberal, Jeez. and we it's a, it's a living wage, man. We should all – that should be the base for everybody. But the – uh, I was that's, making seven bucks. Like, I know, in, in but college. you know what? You gotta. You can't have to have three jobs. That's 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 illegal. <laughs> you should be able to have one job and then have the life. But the, uh, but the, uh, but yeah, I'm making a huge list of Indian films that I want to get up on Shot Decks for sure. And, no, and, it's such. A, I think it's it's. Those are the things that are just gonna make Shot Deck like just a one stop shop because I feel like Indian movies, the thing that you got to understand is that one, they are shot on Alexas and, you know, yeah. and like, you know, they just go all out, but then with their looks and the way their costumes are and everything is just so poppy and colorful. And you throw a little bit of like transformers or the teal orange that they've been doing lately. Like, they look really, yeah. Really cool. Well, and also the whole thing, the thing that I, I really want the site to become is truly a place for discovery. Right. So, so the idea that you could go on looking for some shot of Blade Runner, but discover some shot from some Indian film, or some film from Southeast oh Asia God. or wherever yes. that you've never even heard of, but you're engaged or you're like, you're drawn by an image. And then that maybe leads you down a rabbit hole of discovering that filmmaker or that DP or that designer or whoever. So that's a big part of what we're trying to do with what we're adding, but also like with like even more keywording for like, like keywords that relate to movies. So you can search for Indian films and find all these right. films, or you can search for, lgbtq or you can search for right. female directors or 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 the black experience or whatever it might be 
that will right. just be like a bunch of subject and, and keywords that, that, that are much more robustly genre related than like right. just like thriller and drama and comedy. Right. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, exactly. And then like just building the, the stacking your keywords and filters is something that I just really love. And usually for certain websites, those things are there, but they don't really function. But with Shot Deck, I noticed that it actually like works. Oh, you cool. Just, keep stacking a couple of different things. This director, like, find me Fincher. Now find me, like, his, you know, film shot on film. Like, not... Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then compare. you keep building that up, and you're like, yeah, yes. Yeah, for sure. No, I get excited about all the things we're trying to do. That's for sure. But, uh... All right. I'm going to see if I give you a few more. I'm Should just looking. Why 65 on Joker? Well, I, I love, I've always loved the idea of the fact that you could shoot with more field of view, right? So you can have the field of view of a wide lens in the same way as you do with anamorphic, right? But on a me more medium lens format, which has a shallower depth of field, right? So you're not just like compressing the image and taking away the environment by going longer lens with like shallower depth of field. But now you have the benefit of like feeling the world around, right? So you can see windows and you can see the environment of a small space but you're able to shoot on a lens that provides some 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 separation so i always say it's like the 65 millimeter large format look is like it's like um spherical 3d it's like you're getting almost like a separation effect and this three-dimensional effect on screen because of the depth of field or lack thereof so that's what i like about it but I mean, does that have anything to do with your experience with photography? And did you ever shoot on like medium format? I had a Mamiya, like when I was into photography, I bought a Mamiya and I shot some large format stuff just experimentally for myself, medium format, really. Yeah. But not, not more than just that, not just messing around. All right. So let's, yeah. let's answer this. Are you going to, when is your masterclass coming out? Cause I saw that. Yeah. I'm signing up. I don't, what does that mean? Like a masterclass on the, the masterclass website or like you like way you do a masterclass where it's like, you just do it on your own. The way Either. I do it, because I, I'm, I'm a businessman. I'm not, I, I cut out the middleman, you know, I don't want to have a middleman. I already have like, um, what, what is it? PayPal and Stripe. Those are my middleman. They get a little bit of the cut. And uh, the rest. Like, by the way, I, I, no offense to all the people watching this that are middlemen, but some offense because <laughs> <laughs> only thing I want my son to do is do something where he's not a middleman. Cause I'm like, wait a second. And by the way, the, our, our economy works on middlemen, but I'm like, I'm a little anti, uh, that's, only that's because I'm like, funny. either you make something or you, you know, it's like, or your service or you do something, but like, can we just cut out more of the middlemen in this, in, and women in this world? That's what I'm saying. I mean, there's websites where they're selling your courses for, <laughs> like, there's websites where they're selling your courses for like ten dollars, and then the middleman is taking sixty percent. I'm like, dude, what is going on? Right, right. So, so you should do one because uh, on the on the actual master class, I I did the Aaron Sorkin course. Like, he has a master class, and it was so good. Like, Scorsese is really good too, but like. Aaron was just like, he just goes in. Like, it was so freaking good. So you should look into it. Yeah, well, I'm going to, I got to get Shot Deck off the ground first. So yeah, that's my, that's, yeah, that's, that's enough for me for now. Uh, why do you think the 35 million, yeah, I love Call Me By Your Name. I thought that was cool. I think it's an example of limitations and placing them on yourselves. The fact that, that all of Call Me By Your Name was shot on one lens. Same with, mm. uh, yeah. with um, uh, what's it called? The, the Polanski movie with Jack Nicholson. Why is it coming? Uh, you know, the famous uh, Chinatown. Also yep. shot on one lens. I think it's great. It's a great idea. I thought about it on a movie and then I thought about it on Joker at one point. I thought, oh, that would be cool. Maybe we just shoot the whole movie on one lens and we, we went away from it. But I think yeah. it's a cool experiment. And, and Call Me By Your Name is one of my favorite movies of the last 10 years. So, so I thought it was, it, it was beautiful. Yeah. All right, so what do you what do you think about this? Oh wait, which do you prefer on set? Light meter or false color? Light meter. Light meter. I don't use false color that much. No. Rarely. Rarely. I couldn't even explain it to you if you explain I mean, I know what it is, of course. Right. And I know I was talking to Ed Lockman, who's trying to improve the idea of false color. I'm not hopefully I'm not giving something away, but he's creating something that I think is like and Ed Lockman is a, also a master. He's been a 
I've been a fan of his from, I mean, as far as you can go, it's like the guy is just, is just exquisite. Yeah. Uh, but like, I think that idea of like using a false color type thing to like narrow you in, I think is, is a really effective tool, but I think it's sort of like Lutz. It's probably something I just haven't drawn. Right. I, I'm so like stuck in my ways of like bringing out a meter and I still, I still have a meter on set. I don't maybe use it as much in digital, but I still use it sometimes. Red or Alexa, Alexa, but I'm going to test a new red camera soon. So maybe I'll change my mind. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of like you in a sense that, you know, I, I stick with, I don't get too much into the RCM and Resolve, like, you know, the Resolve's own color management and like, you know, change the color space and use color space transform on every single shot. Like I try to keep it as simple and basic as possible and then go from there. Yeah. <clears throat> There's so many good questions here. Komodo, that's the one I'm going to test. You're right. Stephen Paul. Did you, did you ever, do you ever try, um, like, I like that they called it Komodo. That's because they had a dragon already. That's a pretty good name. Did you and Joaquin really fight on set? No, we didn't. That was all fake. We were trying to do a, that was Joaquin's idea. He said at the beginning of the day, when we got to work, he said, Hey, why don't we do a little Christian Bale thing where I blow up at you and we get in a huge fight. And I was like, I'm not a good actor, so I'm going to fuck it up. So let's not do that. And then he just did it anyway. And that's why you don't hear me saying much, because I was <laughs> laughing and trying not to laugh to give it away. And I thought I would ruin the, the, the yeah. joke. Uh, but most people, it went over their heads, even on set. And they just thought he was like really pissed off at me. And it was awkward. Jeez. And then I thought it would never be seen again until he, he decided to show it on Kimmel. And then my mom was calling and very upset. Just that, uh, cussing him out? Just cussing no, him just out. saying like, oh my God, everyone's going to think that you were like rude to him. And I was like, it was all fake. Uh, so yeah. Well, it was so. the other way around. Like if it was my mom, she would be like, Joaquin this and Joaquin that. <laughs> like, just... you kidding me? Somebody on Twitter literally <laughs> said, how dare you disrespect Joaquin Phoenix like that? And I was like, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake. And I, I, I tweeted back at her because I'm like, it's fake. And she goes, that's just your word. How do we know it's fake? And I literally like, I was like, all right, I can't win this argument. So no, like, no, you'll never win stop. any arguments with the keyboard ninjas. Uh, the keyboard ninjas, yeah, good one. Will you do an Indian film? I would love to. I think that would be like cool. I still got to get to India first. Oh yeah, yeah. I've never been, but that's like in large part because just time, you know. But I'd like to go and you know maybe teach or something. We get out of this whole COVID mean? thing. Well, I was just gonna say. Will you think this will ever end? <laughs> Yeah, it'll end. It'll end. <laughs> I think it's like everything. We'll just become, we'll make adjustments to our lives that will probably stick for a little while, if not for a long time. And we'll just, we, we were very, I, I thought that the interesting thing about this whole COVID thing to go off, off topic for a yeah, second is, and I think in large part, it's also one of the reasons why it's like one of the best things was I felt like in the first two or three weeks of it, we showed our best humanity which was like we showed the ability to one be really flexible and adaptable but also i felt like we were really looking out for each other and feeling this sense of of uh of like common humanity across the whole world that we're all dealing with this together and i thought that was like beautiful and in fact the first four weeks of it i thought it, it was wonderful and then i think it's exposed particularly here in america some of our worst attributes which is impatience individualism mm -hmm. as cloud you know like using individualism as yeah. like a as like uh, you know this this idea that like i'm not going to wear a mask because i'm right. free and you're like well how yeah. about wearing a mask because you're not a dick yeah exactly. and like you care about other people like <laughs> right. it's not like you know what i mean it's it's so it could so, be your own family right yeah and then i think it's also in large part like it's allowed us also to unify behind things like Black Lives Matter, which I'm a big part, of, a big fan of, like just the 100. of like putting a spotlight on what has been happening, and and the fact that now we're or at home, and so we have the ability to pay attention. I think if without COVID, we yes. go back to our same lives of being 
like just right. like you know busy and all the bullshit that allows us just to like see something and then two days later yes. go oh right that thing happened with michael brown and that thing happened with eric garner right. now it's like we are forced to like not be distracted and i think that's right. a good thing um yes. and maybe it'll cause some real change yes yeah, like you a know i think i think every the one other thing i think they should do is every year now we should have a month-long lockdown Right. And the lockdown allows a couple of things to happen. Right. It allows us to like be forced to spend time with our families because sometimes we My end up using work that. and other things as an excuse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The environment gets like a little chill from not everyone driving around all the time for a month. Right. So it's oh, like yeah. a little bit of a clean. We get right. to like do the shit that we never have time for, like spring yes, cleaning exactly. or right. maybe like, you know, just uh, chilling and right. having some mental health breaks. Uh, and then some people will have to work. Because then you can do infrastructure shit that no, you right. can never do because you yes. can't close down things. And you see it now, like people are painting buildings and working on the right. roads and all these things. Yeah, so it's finally like, fix the roads in that way. Yeah. Please. So like, yeah. and then all the people that are essential workers for that, they get a month off in which they get to do whatever the fuck they want, full pay. Now, this is like, that's my, that's my ticket if I was running for president. A, a month long quarantine every year. <laughs> Why don't you? I mean, with that, if you run with that, you're becoming the president. I mean, it's not, you don't even Nobody to wants to be locked down, but I'm like, do it. Because for the first month, I felt like there was a little attitude. But as long as I... I'm losing you. Straight up from the beginning. Yo, six weeks, please don't leave your house. Like, we don't have to put, we don't have to put people on the street to maintain it. Just don't do it. Don't leave your house. We would have shut this thing down in its tracks. But also... Right. And then just said, and don't worry, you're all going to get full pay, whatever you're working on. Right. And then it would have cost less, like by trillions. I know that because you can't, right. you're spending just more to do it for 15, 20 weeks or whatever we're going to do it for. Right. But also, uh, like, you would have this mental state of like, all right, six weeks. Yeah. I'm going to clean my house. I'm going to just spend time yes. with my kids. I'm going to do whatever it is that is like contained. Right. And, uh, and, and the, like, everything would just be a little, I don't know. It's a big step because, you know, everyone's sort of working off of a lot of unknowns. But somebody already said Larry 2020. So, I mean, it's already happening. I feel like you should run. With it's it. not going to happen. I got too many skeletons, man. <laughs> I'll never run for anything. <laughs> oh man. That's insane. But <laughs> I, I, I couldn't agree more. We try really hard to do like, uh, uh, electronic blackout like once a week my wife my wife's idea so like we're not on our phones because like i'm on social media like julian is always like you know texting like you know teenagers are so it's like she's like one day electronic blackout we play board games or we work on a puzzle or something well sunday like, sunday blackout to start and i'm not saying i do this but it's a great idea right. Right. i think everybody needs to do that like yeah. a one day a week blackout no, it needs to if happen, not man. longer, all of no, it. Yeah. it. It has to because or else your life becomes like we always like joke with each other and we say like the life is like Citizen Kane. I mean, if you remember like how yes. they go from like a twin bed to like a yeah, full yeah, size yeah, bed. Yeah, to, yeah. Like, so like we always laugh about it. When we moved to California, we had nothing. So we were like borrowing a little mattress and it's on the floor and then it moves on to this and that. And then it's like now our schedules are flipped. That's right. She's waking up and I'm going to sleep and I'm like the life is like we're like living in the citizen I know, game world. I know. <laughs> well, and you know, it's that thing particularly with like now being mostly at home and working is there's no beginning or end of the workday. It's just 24 seven. And then it becomes, yeah. and, and I'm the worst person for this, trust me. And, and so I'm not practicing what I'm preaching, but I recognize that it's essential. And so I'm trying to do better, but, or just trying to cut it off. But I, I need a lot of help pointing that out to me by my wife and others. So, Same so I like want. when, I like when something's forced upon you, we're like, right. All right. You're, you're quarantined and the internet shut off. And yeah. Like, I mean, listen, trust me, like we, the internet's also been a savior for mental health with like Netflix and other things, but yes. like, so maybe it's like you just get some things, but you can't do other things. So or, you're forced to like, just take a right. fucking break from all of it. Yeah. 100. Like my, I, I need to like change the password for Facebook for my mom because she just gets hung up on so much fake news because she's one of those people that shares everything. So she's just like, oh, COVID is fake. And then next day she's like, COVID is deadly. And she's like, just freaked out and I calling know. us and telling us to stay home and do this and do that. And I'm like, mom, just get off it. Or yeah. I'm going to, I know your password, I'll change it. You know, 
It's crazy. All right, let's go five more minutes. I want to see some of these questions. All right, let's do it. Uh, when I saw somebody say something. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I wish I lived in the 50s, no internet. Yeah. Maybe we just had, we'd do time travel. By the way, I, was, I had a dream last night. It's the weirdest dream. Not weird. It's not that weird and salacious. It's just, it was a dream about me talking with George Clooney about why he chooses certain projects. And then I was thinking about the sim, like the, the way filmmakers are obsessed over certain subject things. Mm -hmm. right like you think about like what happened yeah but like why george clooney but then you think about like the similarities in like subject matter between filmmakers and then i was like what happened to the nolans you know chris and jonathan yeah yeah. that they're obsessed with time everything is about time outside of the dark knight movies like from memento to tenet to like interstellar and inception Inception. even dunkirk is a movie about time Yes, yes, yes. It's like, and Westworld. I'm like, what, what happened when they were four and five years old that made them obsessed with this idea of time? But I love it because it's so consistent to his filmmaking, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. this idea of like what, like, you know, like malleable time or whatever he's obsessed with. So I don't know why that was in my head over sleep. <laughs> that is insane, though. And that is so true to think about it. Yeah. What else we got here? All right, we're winding down. We're clicking down yep. the yeah. The thing. This was fun though, cause I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, do you? Somebody asked. I just saw a question that does Lawrence use shot list? Like, does he create like an old yes. school shot list, or yes. is it a shot like a old modern school. version, the shot deck version of it? Old old school shot list. So okay. I'll write it out shot list I'll, I'll usually write it in editorial order as if like i'm seeing the finished product the finished uh like uh right. se- scene on screen and then i'll then look at that and then reinterpolate it into shots and then i'll draw an overhead schematic of where the angles are and again sometimes i do this as a matter of practice during prep just to sort of figure out what the intent of the scene should be and stylistically and whether it's handheld or long lens or whatever and sometimes that shows up and is, has an effect on the scene. Sometimes it just gets thrown away. But during prep, I'm a big shot list fan. Not a big storyboard fan, but a big shot list fan for sure. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cos. You, appreciate you're it, man. Just, you're the coolest dude. I mean, this is amazing. I, I don't. don't I, nobody would agree <laughs> with you except for you. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> anyway, thank you to everyone who came on and and. Uh, and please vote in, in 2000, in 2020, this November, please just vote. I'm not going to tell you to vote for, but you probably could guess who I'm voting for is Biden. Oh, I told you. Uh, but just, uh, just vote. Please. That means two of us. Yep. That's it. Just vote. Uh, we need, we need, it's embarrassing. The worst thing about, the best thing about Australia is they, ma- they mandate that you vote. So you get, I think, fined if you don't vote. I think that's what yeah. America should be. You should have to vote. It should be your, not just the right you should have to vote and everybody yeah, should yeah, have the freedom to vote by mail for a fucking on a sunday what's this tuesday bullshit just let's yeah. just vote man if you should let the chips fall where they may whoever wins wins but you can't have yeah, yeah, 50 yeah. million people not vote in this country it's right crazy. right yeah no i couldn't agree more that's a good message to leave on. there it is all right cool all right thank you so much peace I know for a fact that you guys took a lot from this conversation. Lawrence is such an authentic human being. He does not hold anything back and he has zero scarcity mentality. Absolutely love the guy. Guys, smash that like button if you're enjoying the content. Subscribe to my channel for more awesomeness. Do not forget to check out the link for the free training in the description below. One hour long training that's gonna take you from not knowing anything about Resolve to grading your first professional gig. And I will see you guys in the next video.